Okay, we're going to start our next great empire, and that's the Inca Empire. So let me get started with the slideshow, and you can follow along as we go. All right, let's start off with the roads that link the empire. This is one of the most important things about the Inca Empire, is that they had this 14,000-mile-long network of roads and bridges that spanned their entire empire. And you can see from the map here that the road was pretty extensive, and it went all the way along the western coast of South America. And it gives a pretty good indication of how large the empire actually was. Now, this road also traversed rugged mountains and harsh deserts. So you can see that the building of this road was a monumental feat, because not only did it go a great distance of 14,000 miles, but it also had to go over some of the highest mountains in the world, the Andes Mountains, which is actually the second highest mountain chain uh, after uh, the Himalaya Mountains in uh, India and Nepal. Now, the roads basically were paved stone, and, or they could be simple paths. So you can see in this picture here, that's a typical Inca road. Not kind of like what we think of roads today, but that kind of path stretching off throughout the mountains is pretty amazing. Also, it allowed the easy movement of troops. And as a result of that, they could bring these troops to different areas of the empire where they could control those zones where trouble might be brewing. And this is one of the things that most people don't realize, that most of the people living in the Inca Empire were not Inca. They were different Native American peoples. And the Inca were all the most recent of the peoples to actually conquer all the people of that region. So they had to use this road system to be able to move their troops around quickly, but also to help con keep control of the population. Okay, they also had these guest houses all along the road, uh, basically shelter for weary travelers. But essentially like a, like a rest stop today where there might be a hotel or a restaurant or a place to eat. Um, you know, those are the sorts of things that you found along these Inca roads. The system was pretty elaborate. And they also had a system of runners that would run along these roads as well. So they traveled the roads carrying messages from one end of the empire to the other. So if you wanted to get a message basically from the northern part of, uh, let's say, Peru all the way down to the southern tip of the empire, it could be done within a matter of like maybe two or three days tops. Uh, that basically these guys would run. They would run until they met another runner. They'd pass the message on to him. Kind of like a Pony Express, but without the ponies. Instead, they just used people. Uh, and so they would also carry not just messages, but also they could carry items. Uh, let's say the emperor wanted to have you know, fish for dinner one night, and he was staying at a palace up in the mountains. You know, he would send a message. Somebody down the coast would get the message. They'd get a fish. The fish would be passed on by two or three runners, and the king could have fish that night. So pretty, pretty elaborate system. Okay, now... Let's say you were going to be the emperor of the Incas and you wanted to basically run your empire and you wanted to create a sense of unity amongst the population. These would be the five steps that you could follow to create unity if you were going to do this. All right, so let's start off with number one. You'd impose a single official language. They called it Chichua, and it was a language that everybody had to learn. So even though many people spoke different languages because they were of different Native American groups, they all had to learn one common language, and that would have been the language that they would have learned in school. Okay, also, they divided the territory and people into manageable units, like provinces, and that made it a little bit easier to manage it, to collect taxes, and also to control the population as well. They also created a central bureaucracy, and this central bureaucracy would basically govern everybody that uh, was in charge of things like taxation and management of things like food distribution, and perhaps even defense. But there was a centralized government where the king basically made all the decisions and then shared them with everybody in the provinces. They also had social groups that were identified by officially dictated patterns on clothing. So nobles wore a particular type of style of clothing with a particular type of pattern, and commoners would wear a different type of clothing and would have a different kind of pattern. And this, of course, would all be weaved into the cloth that they were actually wearing. And then finally, they founded schools to teach Incan ways. So they had an education system that was designed to teach uh, Incan culture, so common identities that would bring people together as opposed to people doing their own individual sort of Native American cultural pattern. They brought them together as Incan. And so these five steps were pretty good at basically bringing people together and creating a sense of unity in the empire. All right, let's take a look at this. This is a picture that uh, most students I have look at, and then I try to get them to figure out what they think it is. So think about this for a second. You know, what does that look like to you? I mean, it's, it's white. It clearly looks like it's made of string. What might that possibly be? And so let's think about that. 
Now, some students might say things like, uh, it's a skirt, or it's a necklace, or you know, maybe it's some kind of uh, hat, or some kind of uh, scarf, or something of that nature. But in fact, <clears throat> what that actually is, is their method of record keeping. Okay, the record keeping system of the Inca actually was that picture of strings that we just saw a second ago. And in fact, that system is because they had no system of writing. They did not have a written language. And this is one of the most important things to remember about the Inca that separate them from, say, the Aztecs. The Aztecs did have writing. The Mayan also had writing. But the Inca had no written records. But instead, what they used was a system called chipu. And this chipu system of record keeping is essentially a complicated set of colored strings. Each string would be tied with a series of different knots, and these knots would be at, located at different uh, intervals along the string. So what you would find is that different colors might mean something, uh, different knots might mean something, a double knot might mean something. So they would use this system, and they would read the knots very easily by basically just sort of counting through them. And so you could collect taxes with this, you could record you know, births, uh, all sorts of information could be gathered. So you, know, you see at the bottom here of the slide, each knot represented a certain amount of its, uh, its multiple. And then the colors of each chord represented an item being counted. And it could be people, could be animals, could be land. All right, these would be things that you could use for maybe taxation. And then also the Chipomayac were special officials who kept records of births, deaths, marriages, crops, and even Incan history. So this was a pretty elaborate system, and in the absence of actually writing, they actually had a system for you able to keep records. The only problem with this is that it's hard to find these things. They don't uh, last very long. They're not carved in stone. The string over time will you know, deteriorate and break down. And also, without the cheap Mayak, the specialists who could read these things, a lot of information could be lost. So an archaeologist might find, you know, let's say, uh, a cache of all these different uh, strings, and they could pick it up, but they'd have no idea what it says because without having the specialists there to interpret it, um, you wouldn't be able to figure it out. Okay, so after the conquest of the Inca by the Spanish, much of their information and their history had been lost because there was nobody around to read the records anymore. Okay, let's take a look at this next topic, and that's the topic of Machu Picchu. This is a topic that most people find uh, very interesting. Basically, it's an example of Incan monumental architecture. Now, it was discovered by Harem Bingen in 1912. So essentially from about the time that the Spanish showed up in the 1500s up until 1912, this city had been abandoned, and nobody knows exactly you know, where, where it had been, why it had been built, who had occupied it. It's still kind of one of those mysteries of history. So what we do know is this, is that there's a sun temple at the complex, there are many public buildings, there's a water system, and even a central plaza that was located right at the top of the base of this mountain. Now, possible uses, it might have been an estate uh, for the king, Pachuti. It might have been a retreat for Incan rulers uh, or maybe the elite, uh, but its actual purpose is really unknown. Uh, people are not quite sure what it was used for. So if we take a look at some pictures, you'll see it's pretty amazing. Uh, it's actually built on the spine, on the top spine of a, a mountain chain, very high up in altitude. Uh, and you can see some of the public buildings. You can see the public square in the center there. Okay, here's another shot, a little more of a panoramic shot. Yeah, it's very amazing that they were able to build this structure as far up as they were. Uh, this is a great shot. This is an aerial shot, and the yellow line indicates where it's actually located. And you can see that it's located mostly along this spined edge over here on the side of the mountain. Um, and so it's pretty amazing that they were able to build that, but it was also easy for them to defend that position if they needed to do so. But again, we don't know what it was actually used for. Now here's an example of terracing at the site. And they would have terraced these hills uh, so that they could actually grow corn or other crops along the sides of this hill without there being any erosion. So they were able to produce enough food to sustain at least some of the people that live there. Again, here's some more of that terracing you can see on the edge there. And you can see some of the structures down here on that the sort of pointed roof structures at the bottom. Now, what we do know about the Inca is that they were master engineers. And so, for instance, Inca builders carved and transported huge blocks of stone and fitting them together perfectly without mortar. So they were able to cut stone and then place it together without any mortar whatsoever. All right. Now, like the Romans, the Inca were masterful engineers and stonemasons, so they were really great at cutting stone. 
They had no iron tools and did not use the wheel. And that's what makes this even more amazing, is that we don't know how they cut these stones. We don't know how they got them to be so accurate. We don't know how they were able to lift them and put them into place. Again, this is one of those mysteries of history. How did the Inca actually do this? The answer is most likely they did it by hand. They did it with other stone tools, and they took a lot of time and effort to get it done but they did not have the same kinds of tools and resources that, say, the Romans might have had when they were building stone buildings. Now, here's an example of some of that stonework. And again, these are pretty amazing. The fact that they're able to cut these stones and get them all to interlock into each other without metal tools is really, really amazing. Here's another example. Again, very intricate work, especially there at the top part. And this here is a pretty interesting thing as well. You can see there's these sort of bulges sticking out on these two rocks, right about here and also up here as well. We're not quite sure what those things are for, but some people think that those might have been part of the process about how they used maybe rope to lift the stones into place. Uh, but again, it's mostly speculation about what those were for and how they actually did that. Now, this gives you a really good idea of how big some of these stones are. They're not small. Some of these stones are really quite large. So again, how did they do it? We just don't know how they were able to do it most likely just through human manpower. But that goes to indicate how amazing this uh, empire was and how sophisticated their building uh, construction techniques were. Here's another example. This is uh, the actual palace that uh, had been destroyed by the Spanish, but you can see much of the foundation is still intact. And here's another elaborate system here. And you can see there's actually a waterfall built into this one here. So this is most likely a temple. Okay, let's take a look now how religion supported the state. The Incan rulers were considered descendants of the sun god, Inti. So it's interesting that the Inca also had a sun god, just like the Aztecs did. They just called him by a different name. All right, now, they also had what was known as the Temple of the Sun. Now, this was located in Cusco, and it was the most sacred of all the shrines to the Inca. And, in fact, it had been heavily decorated in gold, which they believed was the sweat of the sun. And as you can see in this picture, it looks kind of like a Christian church, but that's because the Spanish built one on top of the original uh, temple itself. And you can see at the bottom, there is, in fact, the original Incan foundation for the church. Okay, now, unfortunately, the Spanish, after they conquered uh, the Inca, they not only destroyed the temple, but they also took all the gold that was in the temple. And you can see here in this doorway, uh, which may have been a sort of a, a, either a doorway or a niche or some kind of a, a place for storing something of importance. You can see where gold was at one time actually attached to where those holes are. But again, the Spanish ripped all the gold out when they, when they destroyed the temple. Okay, let's take a look now at the early 1500s and how discord existed in the empire. Now what that means is that they had all kinds of problems. Now these problems at first weren't a big deal because King Juan Yacapac would actually tour the empire. He was a very powerful king, and you know he, like Charlemagne, would travel from one part of the empire to the other, keep an eye on what was going on, and make sure his rule was going all right. Then, what happened was, he was in Quito, Ecuador, when the king opened up a gift box. Now, out of this box flew butterflies and moths, and that was considered an evil omen, a bad sign. And in fact, in about 1525, while he was still in Quito, Juan Yacapac died of a disease. Now, we're not quite sure exactly what disease that was, but most people suspect it was smallpox. Now, smallpox was brought by the Spanish in the early 1500s when they went to uh, Mexico around 1512, uh, 1515. And so what's interesting here is that by 1525, the, the disease, smallpox, had spread all the way to South America before the Spanish even got there. So again, the disease must have traveled along trade routes that had existed and gotten to the Inca Empire before the Spanish conquistadors actually showed up. Now that of course led to problems because once the king died, it led to conflict, particularly a civil war that broke out between his sons Atahualpa and Huscar, who both claimed the throne. Um, they were half-brothers actually, they had a different mother, but they both began to fight with each other to lay claim to the throne. Uh, and in the end, Atahualpa won but in order to win, you know, it basically tore apart the empire. You know, he had to kill his brother. Um, you had Incas fighting against other Incas. Uh, it, you know, it had a negative impact on their ec economy, on their political development. It just wasn't a good thing, as most civil wars aren't. But 
Interestingly, this worked out really great for the Spanish, because at about the time that this was going on, 1532, the Spanish arrived, and as a result, they were able to conquer the empire. So the arrival of smallpox disease basically weakened the empire. They lost their strong leader, King Juan Yacapac. Brothers began to fight against brothers. And as a result, a civil war broke out. And so by the time the Spanish showed up, the, the ingredients for collapse were like set in place, and it made it really easy for the Spanish to conquer the Inca Empire. And in fact, they did so in a very short period of time. So the end of the Inca Empire is dated around 1533, when essentially Francisco Pizarro, a Spanish conquistador, captures King Atahualpa. And Atahualpa actually offered Francisco Pizarro a room full of gold in exchange for not killing him. And he knew that the Spanish were looking for you know, silver and gold. And so he said he could fill a room up with gold, um, you know, up to a, a certain line on the wall, and he promised to be able to do that, and uh, Pizarro accepted. The problem was, after he accepted and after Atahualpa was able to fill the room with gold, Pizarro realized he didn't need him anymore, and so he strangled and decapitated Atahualpa, and that marked essentially the end of the, you know, the king and the ruling elite of the Incan Empire and the beginning of the decline of the Inca civilization. So, let's take a look at Inca power and decline. First of all, we'll start off with the traits of civilization. They had religious belief and theocracy, okay, as most civilizations do. Now, that was a strength that led to power because it united the culture and it made people loyal to the emperor, so that's a positive thing. Now, the weakness leading to the decline was that many physical and human resources were funneled into religious activities. Next, we had a major road system. Now, that strength leading to power basically connected the empire and aided in controlling the empire. And then, how it was a problem for weakness, the enemy could also use the roads to move troops. So not only did you have this major road system, and it helped keep them in power by connecting the empire together, later on when the Spanish showed up, they too used that road system to move their own troops, so that it made it easy for them to essentially conquer the Inca. And the last trait we had was a type of welfare state with a huge bureaucracy, so a huge government that provided welfare for people. Now, that's a good thing, because... Welfare is essentially giving care for your entire population. So during both good times and bad times, the Inca government was able to feed people and take care of people, but they provided welfare, right? Welfare for the people. It's a good thing. The weakness was that people were unable to care for themselves with the elimination of the welfare state. So once the Spanish conquered the Inca and the Inca government collapsed, there was nobody there to provide welfare for the, the common people anymore. And when the Spanish took over, they were not interested in providing welfare for the people. Instead, they were more interested in slaving the people and exploiting them for resources like gold and silver. Uh, and many people, of course, died from disease as well. So the end of welfare came to the Inca Empire, uh, and many of the people then sort of just gave in to the Spanish because they were always looking for somebody to take care of them. So that is another contributing factor for why the Inca were so easily conquered by the Spanish. So you can see these are interesting traits here because all three of these traits of civilization also help to make them powerful, but at the same time, they also help lead to their decline. So the things can be good, but also things can be bad. It all depends on what the circumstances are going to be. Okay, that's pretty much it for the Inca Empire. So there you go. We'll move on to our next empire.